Microscopic Anatomy of Bone. All right, so over here you've got a long bone, and we just went over the components of a long bone. We talked about uh, the compact bone, you know, is this outer layer. And then we talked about the spongy bone at either end of the bone. And what we're going to look at right now is a close up of a little bit of that compact bone, okay? So all bone has um, a blood supply. It is alive, and that's one of the reasons why it hurts so much if you break it, because it has a great blood supply and a great nerve supply. So you could imagine, let's say, an artery going in to the bone and then a vein going out of the bone. We usually use red for arteries and blue for veins. And I'm just going to use yellow. Also, uh, let's not forget, it has a nerve nerve supply too, so nerve going into the bone uh, at various points, not just at this one point either. I'm simplifying the diagram. And then over here you can see that this would be um, a couple of osteons. So here's an osteon, here's an osteon. There might be numerous osteons that make up the thickness of the compact bone, but this would represent the outside of the bone and then over here this would be the bone marrow. So uh, going through the compact bones are what are called perforating canals, and that would be kind of all of this. So a perforating canal passes through, oops, you can't see what I'm doing, sorry. and it allows the passage of blood vessels and nerves. In and out of the bone marrow. Okay, so we can draw an artery. So you can follow along with me. This squiggly blood vessel uh, represents an artery. Taking oxygen to and nutrients. Actually, let's use pink. Whoa, sorry. So it's going to bring oxygen and nutrients for example, a couple of important ones might be B12 and iron, and other nutrients necessary to make red blood cells. And then a vein would leave the bone marrow, also exiting out through a perforating canal. Because bone is solid, right? So you've got to have a tunnel through it for soft and squishy things like blood vessels and nerves. And the names of those tunnels are perforating canals. And also, um, you know, what we should add to the hormones that stimulate red blood cell production, such as um, erythropoietin, would be carried in that blood from the kidneys. And then the vein is leaving. Let's use blue for that. It's going to carry all of those new blood cells and platelets. Of course, it's also going to be carrying away um, 
the waste like carbon dioxide and other metabolic waste, like maybe lactic acid or something. Okay, then there's the nerve supply. We can use yellow for that. So you've got arteries, veins, and nerves coming through tunnels in the bone called perforating canals. Oops, sorry. And the nerve is going to have both directions, right? Sensory and motor. So sensory is going to give you the feeling if a bone were to break. And motor, actually, uh, motor fibers may actually deliver certain kinds of stimulation to a bone that tell it how to remodel. But those are a little less understood. But there is nervous input to the bone. All right. Now we'll look at the structure of the osteons itself. Oh, let's put bone marrow right here because this is this side would be the bone marrow and this side would be the outside of the bone. Now, the osteon, we're, my picture is kind of looking a cross section and a longitudinal section at the same time. But remember, this is three dimensional, and so you're going to have many, many, many. Uh, cells, osteocytes, surrounding or as in layers as you go down the osteon. Maybe I should just shut up and start drawing. Okay, make some green lines going out. And these are the cells of the bone. They're called osteocytes. And if you look microscopically at an osteon under the microscope, you'll see these black slashes that represent, that are the osteocytes. So the osteocytes, whoops, are bone cells. That's what it literally means, bone cells. And they are stuck in place But when they were young, and laying down calcium salts and glycoproteins, matrix, they were called osteoblasts. So when they were osteoblasts, they came from the either the endosteum or the periosteum, and they actually move through the bone like an amoeba. Then they sit down somewhere, they lay down matrix all around themselves, and then once they stop laying down matrix, they're called osteocytes. Okay, now the matrix that's laid down, let's go ahead and draw that in alternating colors of orange and yellow. And these alternating layers are called lamina. That's why this compact bone is sometimes called lamellar bone, because it has these really distinctive layers like the trees, like tree rings. This is the matrix. The matrix is calcium salts and glycoproteins and collagen fibers. Okay, so we'll use um, orange. I'm going to put this up here. Was I saying glycoproteins? I really should have been saying collagen fibers. I was thinking about intervertebral discs. So the lamina are sheets of 
bone matrix. And so that means that they are filled with calcium salts and collagen fibers. So if you look at a chunk of bone, you can see that more of it is matrix than cells, and that's typical. All of the osteocytes are connected together, and I'll show you how. Blood supply going up. And then venous blood would be going down to the vein. And nerve supply too, but I won't bother to put that on. It makes our picture a little messy. So all of the osteocytes are connected with their blood supply. These little tiny tunnels that go through the bone in each osteon. Let's use pink for that. And those little lines that we drew here are called canaliculi because they're little canals or little tunnels through the bone that connect all the osteocytes. So they connect all osteocytes in an osteon. That's how the osteocytes get their oxygen and any nutrients they need for metabolism. And if they get cut off from the blood supply, maybe there's a broken bone and the canaliculi are blocked, uh, then those osteocytes will die and the bone matrix will start to break down along with it. So somehow the osteocytes help to maintain the integrity of the lamina. And then the central canal is the tunnel that goes up vertically in each osteon to deliver um, blood supply and nervous supply. So the perforating canal is horizontal, horizontal perforating canal, vertical central canal, and then canal liculi. So you've got three tunnels. The biggest tunnel is the perforating canal. Next visit, biggest is the vertical central canal, and then the canal liculi radiate out horizontally again, although in my picture it almost looks sideways but, or up and down. So these are horizontal, this is vertical, this is horizontal. Okay, down at the bottom of the page I want to go over a little bit about bone healing. And the processes involved. So first, if a bone is broken, a hematoma forms at the site of the break. Hema means blood, toma means tumor, so it's like a big blood clot. And that's going to stop further blood loss. And then the periosteum is activated. The periosteum is that membrane around the outside of the bone, and it stimulates both chondroblasts and osteoblasts. Now, chondro, what do you think that means? It means cartilage bud. Cartilage can develop quicker than bone, and so it's like a temporary stopgap and supportive structure. And this cartilage won't be around forever, though. It's just uh, temporary. And then uh, the osteoblast will quickly make something called woven bone, which is not, if you were to look at it, it doesn't look anything like compact bone. It's not dense. Um, and it's not really like trabecular or spongy bone either. It looks disorganized, but it's really quick to make. So it's another stop gap. So this, you kind of get, get this stuff going on and then, eventually, over the course of 
I don't know, maybe eight weeks, depending on how the break is. It's replaced with spongy bone or trabecular bone. And that would be when you would say, oh, yeah, my broken bone is healed. I can take off the cast and all that good stuff. But your bone is actually not done healing at that point because this trabecular bone is not as strong as compact bone. And so then slowly over time, maybe over three to four years, replace that spongy bone with lamellar or compact. If you're a child, that process is going to be very short. If you're an adult or an elderly person, this process could take many, many years. Actually, three to five years I meant to put. So definitely an adult or an older person would be five years and beyond. A young person might be, you know, three years or less even. So if a doctor is looking at an x-ray, they can tell what's going on. They can tell what stage you're at. Are you, did you just break it and you're making woven bone? And they maybe see some temporary cartilage. Uh, has it been replaced with spongy bone? So you can see, oh yeah, you know, there, there was a bone break in the past few years. Or has it now started to be replaced with lamellar bone? And even after this point, there will be a, um, a difference in the structure of the osteon, and there will be some fibroblasts, so some collagen fibers that remain, that give it a scar, and that can, so you can tell if at any point in their life someone had a broken bone.